Okay. I think it's okay. Um, hello, um, I'm James, or Jay. I am a philosophy student at an undisclosed university. Um, and this is one of many, or the first episode of which I will call kind of documenting some of the thoughts or beliefs or writings I have done in these presential mo moments uh, for myself in the future. Kind of a recollection of how I might have developed from here and then uh, till then. So, um, of course, that, that is the primary purpose of this. Um, other purposes can be, um, if anybody wants to listen along to what, I've trying to what I'm trying to say or what I've been thinking about, um, that is awesome too. Um, that is why, that is probably one of, the, one of the biggest reasons I am uploading this to YouTube as a public video instead of a private one. So if anybody wants to just kind of listen along, have this in the background, have a conversation, uh, so you may not actually be conversing with me, but rather just me talking to you. That is cool too. So I'm sorry about the mic quality. I know it's pretty horrible because um, I tried setting up this microphone right here and it didn't work because for some fucking odd reason. I'm, I'm sorry. I, this is I thought. I thought considering this is the first episode, I thought it'd be sufficient to just kind of use it use the mobile microphone i am planning to edit some of these or edit most of these but considering this is the first episode and i kind of wanted to ease into it i thought just recording myself it's kind of like a test run might be something i could do if this goes well i will edit it but i'm planning to upload it tonight and uh, yeah so today's topic is kind of a very relevant one, in my opinion, and it's really it's really on the topic of of uh, moral motivation. Moral motivation. So when one so what that describes is like when one when one recognizes something as true or like a belief one has in association of what they think is universally true, for example. A pretty good example of, of present things going on right now is Black Lives Matter. And this movement is incredibly relevant to, um, to, the, uh, to the shift and universal acceptance of its principles. And it's a, it's a very good thing. And generally, the question moral motivation wants to kind of ask is, so I recognize these principles of which I believe in is true. I'm sorry about my heater. It's pretty horrible. I you can probably hear everything, including these desktops and shit like that. I'm sorry. Anyways, so there are these fundamental things in which somebody believes is true. So I believe these principles, and they're correct universally, right? And because I recognize, because the agent is able to recognize X, the agent will necessarily act upon X in which there is a causal connection between recognizing something as true, right, and correct for all, and actually acting upon it because it is right, true, correct for all. So the question I want to ask is, where does this causal connection come from? So why must I act upon my beliefs? Why must I act upon what is true for me and true what I believe to be true for all? Well, the question is probably obvious then, because, well, why wouldn't you? You believe it's right, and the only way to achieve this rightness of the action is through, sorry, the rightness of these principles is through action. It is with action that I can actually make these principles true. Well, yes, you're, it, that, is, that is very true. The action is necessarily the only uh, method, or not method, rather, the only thing that can be done for the sake of upholding these principles in which one believes in. But there it goes again. It's 
you can kind of question that further, as it might not be as obvious. Just because I believe something is true, italics on why, why must I act upon it? Like, why is there this motivation? Where does motivation come from? It seems like it's so innate within human nature in where I recognize something as true, so I have to, so there's this motivation associated to acting upon it. There's this cause. So I recognize this thing as true, and that immediately causes me to be motivated to act upon it, and thus results into action, right? That's the consequence. So, while it might be obvious that this thing exists, and it, it exists because it's within our nature, there are questions on how that, that may be answered, where why must these things exist in the first place? What is this cause? What is this motivation associated with this, co- that this belief that I have? Like, why is, does that exist, right? So, like, of course, this goes into topics of metaphysics and and slightly epistemology, of course. And, like, I think this is very important to consider because, first of all, sure, one might be motivated to act upon um, generally what they believe in. But if one doesn't understand necessarily why it is important to act upon these beliefs, then... There's questions on whether you should act upon them at all, because if you don't understand what you're doing, you could be wrong on what you're doing it for and what you're doing it for the sake of, right? So if you you want to act upon something, I think there's a condition in where you must understand it. You must understand uh, why you're acting upon it. And generally, this is true. And this is the truth I believe in. And this is why I will act upon it. Of course, that in, that in itself is kind of self-defeating, of course, because, again, where is the motivation associated with that, right? So, like, of course, there's, there's going to be this infinite regress of motivation associated with Jesus fucking Christ, how many layers of choices we might have. So this is very important to consider because moral motivation is just generally one of the many things people have in daily lives, and yet do not stop to consider why it must be so important. Why, where does this come from? Why must it be the case of this, right? So today I will kind of bring out, um, oh man, I will kind of bring out one of the things, um, I will, I will will try to talk about that within the context of Plato, in which he talks about the psychic harmony, the psychic soul, the psychic justice, and where when one has a harmonious soul, when one has some sort of conditions in which the soul is perfect, as Plato describes, and I will describe it later and how it works, then there's this natural inclination or motivation to do justice, right, to act rightly, to act justly, to have virtue, right, so I'm going to try and, and think about this moral motivation in association with Plato's justice and Plato's psychic harmony, and then kind of try to tackle it in where Plato's psychic soul is probably not sufficient enough to consider this moral motivation, and then I'll probably go into some stuff Albert Camus says on moral motivation. And then I'll stop there and then argue that maybe that there are such things that are uncaused in which they might exist without moral motivation, right? So, all right, that is firstly the introduction. So, um... I'm not sure if I should cut it here, or I should... I mean, I don't want to edit it, so I think I'll just keep going. I apologize for my heater again. Um, so I do have my essay out. Um, so I will th- I will talk about Plato and, and the Republic and what he talks about, about the harmonious soul. So he likes to talk about 
psychic justice, right? He thinks it's the most natural form of the good. So what is the good? The form of the good, right? So the psychic harmony will kind of motivate us to aim for what is good. The good being the just, the right, the truth, right? So probably have to talk about Plato's forms a little bit. Plato's forms is kind of this essential part of reality in which there are essential properties or conditions that some object or real objects have that will intrinsically have some sort of purpose to, but property that describes its realness, right? I know it's kind of abstract and it's there's really no better way to describe it. There are probably better ways because maybe I'm not very sufficient or I'm not sufficient enough to kind of describe it to you. But right, if you think about, like, for example, this charging brick, right? It's broken. It's pretty horrible. But um, this charging brick is a charging brick because of its essence. Its essence and its real property associated to what makes it a charging brick. And this form of the charging brick is some sort of metaphysical condition in which beyond the physical, there is some sort of property that makes it real to us, right? So we are experiential beings in association with these real things and therefore will produce um, this distinct um, understanding of what these forms are of these objects, right? Of course, Plato thinks um, only philosophers can understand what the forms are, and Plato thought he knew what the forms are, so I'm not sure on uh, whether I know what the form of a charging brick is, because there's 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 assumption of epistemology there, or knowledge, like how do I know it, right? How do I know these forms? And there are questions about that too, but that's not something I'll cover today. But generally, this charging brick has its real property, and I think that is sufficient to know for the sake of what I'm trying to say here today. Yeah, so that is the form, right? So psychic justice will, so the psychic justice will have this intrinsic motivation to act upon or to, to leap or to kind of reach the good, the good being the form of the good, right? So there are conditions. So I, I'm going to try to explain what the harmonious soul is now. So such conditions are pretty much noted. So condition one is the natural ordering of the harmonious soul. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the intrinsic desire to keep one's psychic harmonious soul healthy and the pursuit of objective happiness, right? So these conditions in which a harmonious soul has to, in order to be a harmonious soul, we'll use these conditions to, um, to, to actually strive for justice and this is what makes uh, the harmonious soul the harmonious soul right so um the first thing i will talk about the first condition is the um the natural ordering of the harmonious soul ordering so in the harmonious soul right there are these natural things associated to what is the soul what what like what am i and what is my essence? And what is my being? What is my existence, right? And if we think about it that way, you might think, okay, maybe I'm just some um, homo sapien living on this planet with no soul, or rather just brain functions in which I am illusion to think. I have some sort of will associated with my soul, right? That might just be an empirical approach to what modern, uh, like a modern skeptic, of you know ancient philosophers might say but put put that aside for now and think about if i were to have a soul there would be things associated with what makes my soul the soul right there is um what you would call it everybody kind of has these appetitive desires so i don't know for example my appetite right the hunger I wanna, I'm hungry, so I, like, there's this natural inclination to fill up this appetite, right? And yeah, that, that's, that's one, that's an appetitive desire. And, oh, my computer, fuck, okay. 
And an appetite of desire does not mean natural in the sense where it's part of our nature. It does. But there are also things associated with, like, hedonistic things. Like, um, my appetite. Maybe I crave for, random, random, random example, I crave for, I don't know, alcohol or sex or drugs. It's these things that are incredibly hedonistic in the sense where it's pleasure over pain most of the time. And these things are in associated, association with appetitive desires. These are kind of what our natural instinct kind of aims for. We want pleasure. We want and to, we want to avoid pain. And there are these drugs and recreations that allow us to do this. And thus, that is what... Um, that is the... Uh, that is in association to what is the soul? Well, that is one part of the soul, right? But there are other parts, certainly, like glory um, and shame. And there are these natural virtues associated with what we do that is a part of our soul. So, for example, another part of the soul is um, glory, right? We do actions, we do things for for the sake of our glory and, um, and the way we look or the way we feel. Right, I don't know. Um, for example, one might be so inclined to... I don't know, save a pedestrian, not for the sake of it being a good action, but for the sake of maybe, for the sake of feeling good about yourself, right? And that might actually bring you glory in the sense where the people love you and you might feel good about that. And yeah, that, that, that is one part of the soul in which the soul craves for, right? But, there, but what Plato thinks to be the most important part of the soul is reason, right? Rationality is actually kind of the most, the highest part of the soul in which it controls the glory parts, in which it con controls the appetitive parts, the hedonistic parts. Reason will allow us to kind of um, be the ruler of such intrinsic natural inclinations to do things or to, to, to have things. So, 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 so that is the natural ordering part of the soul. I know that was a little bit disorganized. I apologize. So, just, just to sum it up, reason will allow us to, reason is on the top as the most, as the most valuable part of the soul in which, it kind of, um, in, in, in which it kind of slaves the passions, the the hedonistic stuff, the appetitive part, the uh, glorified stuff. Reason is the highest form of the good in part of the soul, and thus, the most reliable right so um that is not sure how relevant it is to moral motivation but that is something important to think about right there's this natural ordering of the harmonious soul in which reason overrules all of such and plato thinks it's sufficient to think that um reason is kind of the most important because like when you think about hedonistic stuff he doesn't really like it um in my opinion i don't really like it either um sex drugs alcohol rock and roll stuff like that you know doing cocaine crack plato thinks it's kind of a an illusory form of happiness in which in which he kind of thinks it's when you strive for pleasure over pain in like all of your actions right that's what hedonism essentially is it's really unmaintained it's really um unrealistic in the sense where when you aim for happiness, it's kind of the fulfillment of happiness, but when you keep doing these hedonistic things, you're never going to be fulfilled, right? And, and tyrannical, where you're kind of just a slave to your passions, where like your body and your, your things are kind of just only aiming for these pleasures and where you don't have any independence and you, and you kind of, you are not free from these things that your body and your soul just just hedonistically want, right? Plato doesn't think that way. He thinks it's illusory in the sense where it won't really reach real happiness because, right, he, he, he likes to think of it this way, right? So let's say there's like this hot cup, this really cold-ass cup, and this is really neutral cup, right? Let's say you put your hand in the boiling-ass water, right? Let's say it's really, really hot. Like, you keep it there for like 30 minutes, right? 
and all of a sudden, whoa, okay, yeah, it's out of the water, and I put in the neutral cup, right, the warm, the room temperature cup, I put it in there, and whoa, it, wow, it feels really, really good, it's the, it's a lot better than the warm, or the, the boiling cup, in the sense where I am no longer feeling any pain, and it feels good to have it in here, right? Right, but that that misses that misses the mark because what Plato thinks is when you put your hands in the in the uh, in the room temperature cup, it's not really pleasure, right? It's what what you're really doing in reality is you're simply putting your hand into what is most neutral. Rather, you are just kind. It is simply just getting rid of the pain of what you felt previously or prior. And it's not really pleasure because what pleasure would be, it would be in accordance to what reality is, right? When you're being pleasured by what is not reality, because reality is is it is that it is just a neutral cup and not a, uh, not a pleasure cup, you are feeling this that is not in accordance to what is actually real and therefore maintained in an illusory form of happiness rather than uh, a good one or an objective one, right? So Plato, Plato is kind of an objectivist. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go into that more. Um, so in the second condition here, there is this thing called... Uh, the second condition is the intrinsic desire to keep one's psychic harmonious soul healthy. Um, so, the same thing as physical health. If I'm sick and I'm feeling like garbage, let's say I have COVID or something, I will want to get better. There's this natural inclination that I want to get better. And Plato thinks it's the same thing with your soul. Where if you have a, a corrupt soul or like a tyrannical soul, there's this natural inclination that you're, you want your soul to be healthy, right? Just so, just like, just like your body, you want your, let's think of your mental, mental health too. There's this natural motivation, not motivation, but there's natural um, desire to have your mental health as healthy as your physical health and as healthy as your physical soul, or not physical, your, ascent, your essence and your soul, right? So with that aside, that's the second condition. And, right, so if you think about the third condition, and that is just kind of what I talked about previously, it's kind of the pursuit of objective happiness. So Plato is an objectivist. He thinks that there is an objective happiness rather than a subjective or rather relative happiness. Um, and he thinks reason will allow this, right? So he thinks... Um, So the wise man who acts reasons such as to maintain psychic harmony will surely use it to proportionate their real happiness and become the happiest, right? That is part of the Republic. So, and on the other hand, the hedonist who acts to have more illusory desires brings great unhappiness because of the non-objective, illusory kind of happiness and its appetitive nature. And you're kind of a slave to your passions and a slave to these pleasures in which they are not in accordance to what is actually real and important. And what is important is what is what is real. And you always want to be with what is real, right? That's kind of implicit, of course, but like let let's let's just have that premise established for now. So of course there are problems with this and I of course I disagree with it. Um I don't really disagree with the um with parts about the uh, illusory stuff, I think there's a better way to explain it rather than being in accordance to what your essence is, like Plato says. But um, like that—that that is another topic for another day. But um, yeah, so Plato thinks that um, these conditions to have these conditions will ensure one to have a harmonious soul, right? A good soul, and then it will directly cause one to be just. It will directly motivate one to be just, to act on the good, right? Right, and that that is that is kind of like a problem because like he never really establishes why the soul is directly associated with the good, 
right, you, like, he might, he, he might say, like, um, let's see, he might say, like, the soul is naturally good in general, right? It is just the good. So, of course, there's this causal connection between the soul being good and the result being good. The results being your actions. Right? I know this is kind of confusing. Um, I apologize. Maybe I need to get better at this. But, um, yeah, so those conditions aside. So what I want to argue here is that Plato kind of presupposes or kind of thinks that these conditions are innate within these within individuals um so um so if one were to actually be just and desire the best for themselves one must agree that they have the desire to engage in the right decision so if plato suggests the right and best conditions for living right so the soul is the best conditions for living or the harmonious soul is. One must undoubtedly follow what Plato thinks is the harmonious soul, All right? So of course, if you're, if, of course, if somebody recognizes the best way of living, they're going to act upon it because they want the best for themselves. They want themselves to be happy. They want to get some pleasure. They want to feel good about themselves. And like, there's this natural motivation associated with that, in which you can argue that is kind of a problem within moral motivation, right? But um. Generally, just for the sake of this video, I think somebody just kind of has to know Plato has a harmonious soul and he thinks it's the best way of living. And from that, the best way of living, there is this natural inclination to act upon the just, the good, in the form of the good. And there's this causal, causal connection between that and that, right? So that's obvious. That aside, Let's think about, let's think about desire, right? Motivation. Let's think about that quickly. Um, so, so the question of on why individuals desire some sort of truth as a motivator can be answered through the individual's desire to pursue correct beliefs. So, so some examples of this could be like, a reason Socrates spreads knowledge is because of his desire to spread the right truth. A reason for why I'm arguing this claim right now, right, is because I have the desire to spread truths on this paper or this video. A reason for why one acts upon social justice is because of one's desire to spread knowledge. So I did talk about this early in the video, but just for the sake of the... Uh, of formatting purposes, I will go over it in more detail. So it seems as though in every instance, actions happen because of the, the, the desire to act according to what the individuals believe in, right? So in simpler terms, the cause for why individuals act is dependent on their desire to pursue their truth, right? So like a good example of like, maybe, so Aristotle might think the same thing, so, as Aristotle claims, every action and rational choice is thought to be aimed at some good, right? The good being the result of said action. And so the good has been aptly described as well that, uh, at which everything aims. Jesus Christ. So, the good can be described as belief, as when the individual pursues the good, the individual pursues belief, right? They pursue their belief. So, like, even the unjust man, even the like the person doing wrongs, right? Who has the desire to do unjust things is acting upon his truth and belief. So one, one robs a bank for the sake of thinking that, okay, I'm robbing this damn bank because I want to rob this damn bank, right? They're acting in accordance to what their belief is to act, or sorry, to rob banks, right? That's their belief. Or, or it is true to rob banks, that's their belief. So belief is made from the desire of truth um, therefore, the pursuit of the good is the pursuit of the truth. So naturally, Plato, pursuing the good, will pursue the truth, right? The truth being what they believe in. So this hidden premise, right, within Plato's argument, is kind of clear because 
of course, as I mentioned, there's this natural thing that Plato thinks is that when you have this motivation, you're gonna, or you're, when you have this soul, when you have this perfect being or perfect essence, you're gonna wanna pursue the good all the time, right? Or pursue this truth that you believe in, pursue the good, right? And that is problem because that is an assumption. It's kind of an assumption that people generally will pursue their truths or generally will, will pursue the things that they believe in. Of which I argue it is not always the case that people will pursue the beliefs that they believe in, right? Right, and that, that's kind of contradicting to what I'm doing right now, of course, because what I am doing is kind of acting upon what I believe in, right? But aside from that, of which I will cover in some other video, maybe, or maybe I will talk about it a little bit in the end of the video, I will argue that there is kind of some sort of um, unreliable causal connection between correct beliefs and actually acting upon them, right? I don't think that there's any sort of reliable way of um, saying or any sort of way to actually see this motivation happening from said realization of belief. So I'm going to kind of go over why and to kind of give you an argument to um, to why Plato doesn't actually consider this, right? So um, I think it's perfectly possible to, uh, hold on, so... So obviously Plato make mistakes this to be a natural link to actually have a harmonious soul and act upon the good. But obviously this is an assumption, right? And this only applies if one has the desire or motivation to pursue the good in the first place. So I'm gonna try to introduce a hypothetical man and a figure. Um, from Albert Camus' philosophy, from the myth of Sisyphus, and a, like a, a man and a figure acting without cause. So I'll talk about an amoralist, and then I'll talk about an uncaused person. So I will now argue for why a man acts uncaused by their desires for truth to exist and still provide some sorts of meaning or some sort of um, results, but not for the sake of the results that happen from these actions, right? So, so a man is presented with no moral restraints, right? Somebody who kind of believes in amoralism, where there's no moral truth at all. So one without the ability to purposely engage in moral behaviors. So an individual that is kind of able to conceptualize what morals are, but he kind of fails to act upon them because he doesn't think they're true. So... The main, the, sorry, the man engages in actions, but in his words, without sufficient reason. There isn't any reason to actually act upon these truths, right? The question is, like, would such a man exist? So, like, obviously, this kind of seems like a person that is kind of committed to the philosophy of amoralism, in which it kind of um, suggests that there is no moral truths, and, and thus, I'm just kind of acting upon whatever... Um, whatever I feel in the present and not in accordance to any sort of belief that I have, right? But of course, that doesn't really avoid uh, motivation, right? Because he is still engaged in moral motivation. Like, he still acts upon amoralism. He still acts upon believing in amoralism to be that as a belief and therefore produces actions from that belief. So there's still a, some sort of moral motivation associated with that and with, with the belief and, and the results, right? So that is, so he doesn't avoid it. So what might avoid it actually is kind of Camus' philosophy in which he kind of presents a man that is sufficiently acting without um, any sort of motivation or cause at all, right? So of course, like it's kind of, it, it, it is a myth for a reason, right? But like, if you think about it, like some some of these things are very relevant to to what uh, might 
what to my to what life might be uh, to what Camus said about life in general. So I'm gonna try and and say these set of questions very quickly. So um. So what is the reason or cause of life, right? That that is that that is a very existential question, right? So, well, of course, Camus would kind of ask that kind of question. So, or more simply, what is the meaning of life, right? I don't mean to kind of be, you know, <laughs> present these existential questions to, to to people watching or anything like that. But I think it's very relevant to consider, considering how Camus' philosophy can actually be really relevant to uh, to our lives, to people's lives in general. So, so it seems as this philosophy question is directly correlated with moral motivation, right? So why should the individual engage in life, which is the truth, right? The truth is life. The truth is that I'm living, and like, why should I engage in this life when there's no reliable motivator, right? The motivator being the meaning to keep engaging in such. My camera's lagging, I apologize. Hold on, hold on. I think it's my internet. I, I, I apologize. So, um, so, why should the individual engage in life when there is no reliable motivator or any meaning to engage in such? This is assuming that there's no meaning within the philosophy of Camus. So, similarly, why should the individual engage in just actions, which is the truth, when the only thing being the cause of such is the authority of one's belief, which is the harmonious soul. So what is right, which is life, does not necessarily lead to any sort of motivation to kind of act upon it. So just because I'm alive, right, just because it's a fact that I'm living right now, um, I really wish my camera would stop lagging. It kind of pisses me off. Oh, fuck. All right, let me try and... Let me pause it here. I'm trying. Okay, I, I apologize for that. There was just some stupid connection error. Um, so where was I? Um, so yeah, it, it, it paused at a really, really tough moment because I, I, was, I was just getting into it. So why should the individual engage in life? truth when there is no reliable motivator or meaning associated with it so what is right which is living does not necessarily lead to motivation to do such actions so to kind of get around this right i'm going to give an example from camus text which is the myth of sisyphus of course so um as a primary drive for why cause or reasons for an action just do not really matter right so that is, so the gods had condemned Sisyphus to ceaselessly rolling a rock to the top of a mountain, when the stone would fall back of its own weight. They had thought, with some reason, that there is no more dreadful punishment than futile and hopeless labor. I see that man going back down with a heavy, yet measured step towards the torments, of which he will never know the end. So, however. That the struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Right, so this is a pretty famous quote for the philosophy of absurdism and within existential philosophy in general. So, so why are you using this example here is because, so it, it's, it's really, really, it's really associated with, with, with life in general, right? Because when you think about the truth, the truth is, is, is that I'm living right now. Of course, yeah, yeah. And what is right, which is my life, does not, and well, life in general, which is the belief and um, which is the truth, right? The good and the truth, does not necessarily lead to any motivation to live it, right? It's, it sounds depressing, I realize that, right? But like, if you think about it, there's this causal connection between, between actually acting upon this belief that I have of this of this philosophy of this life that I have and and what results from it is me living correct right but if you think about it this man th this figure 
the Sisyphus is actually doing actions, right? He's actually doing stuff without thinking about why he's doing them, or rather, there's no cause for why he's actually doing them in the first place. Yes, there is a cause, but like the cause is that like they condemned him and he's like rolling the hill now, or like rolling the boulder up the hill now, right? But if you think about it, there's no cause in itself where it motivates him to do that action specifically. There's no motivation associated with his uh, his actions that he's doing in, in this in this in this thing, right? And yet he does it and yet produces something. And he produces something of that is meaningful towards him and his life in general, which is happiness. Happiness is su- like sufficiently alone and happening without any sort of motivation or cause of which it causes him to do this action forever and ever and ever and ever. And yet he still remains happy and yet remains uncaused somehow. And that is a really good example, I think, of something that is sufficiently has no moral motivation associated with it, and yet still acts according to some sort of action he does, right? And yes, so that that is that is sufficiently or necessarily a very good thing, because generally, if you think about the questions earlier, um, the set of questions I asked them earlier, the meaning of life, one would necess- one would think that that is something. That would be a motivator to something to someone acting upon their life in general, right? But if you know Camus' philosophy, he would argue that no, you don't need a motivator. You do not need any sort of cause or any sort of harmonious soul or any sort of good or aim that actually results in you being happy. And a lot of the times, that is enough for one to keep living. Right. So to to ask my question earlier, why should I necessarily act upon the right, which is the life, or the truth, which is life, when there's no motivation associated with it? Well, you should act upon it because it naturally is an uncaused action of which you don't really need any motivation to keep acting upon it. And that is, I think, very beautiful to what Camus thinks. And generally, um, yeah, that, that is that is something that I think is very very cool. So, so to summarize, Sisyphus rolling the stone is in no way caused by any sort of moral motivation associated with it or any reason other than him just doing the task for the sake of really no teleological or deontological purpose at all, maybe deontological, but so there are no ends no reason, no motive, and no belief to associate Sisyphus ruling the stone, yet he keeps doing the action purposely, right? So it seems like though actions without any meaning, purpose, or reason can still happen, yet achieve a sense of happiness, not a reason or cause, of course. So one can imagine Sisyphus happy is not stating that Sisyphus has something he is doing it for. Neither is it a reason to keep doing the action. Instead, the moral motivation that Plato assumes within his argument to be the cause, the right action, is not present within Sisyphus, right? He doesn't need moral, he doesn't need motivation, nor does it need any sort of cause or any sort of harmonious damn soul to keep doing this action or keep aiming at the good or aim at good things, right? Good things being happiness. Yet he's still doing it gladly without such necessary conditions that Plato thinks is so essential for the soul and so essential for the being and existence, or or any sort of moral motivation in general or belief. So something potentially good really does not really, does not need cause or belief for it to happen. Rather, therefore, the moral motivation one has in doing actions is unrequired. So as actions can happen regardless of the individual's belief and desire to pursue the good, the good being happiness. Therefore, a harmonious soul is unrequired as a cause for all actions, including just actions as well. 
which is really beautiful in my opinion, right? It's 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 a really nice way to put um, absurdism within the philosophy of uh, of Platonism, in the sense where it's so essential for a lot of people to have, or according to Plato, to have these conditions to make them strive for the good. Yet, he is doing it without any sort of cause, which Plato assumes within his arguments, right? So, I don't, so, yeah, I think that is very beautiful. I keep saying that, but I, I think it is. Anyways, so, to kind of conclude it, um, so, in the, in, this is actually a paper I wrote for my philosophy class. Um, so, I consider Plato's argument of the harmonious soul and what he calls psychic justice. Um, I looked through his conditions, and I kind of explained them. And what makes a harmonious soul? The harmonious soul. And, and I argued that he assumes um, there's this moral motivation associated with individuals. So I expanded on his conditions and disproved the desired reason one has with moral motivation, stating how just actions can happen regardless of the harmonious soul, disproving his claim with the philosophy of Albert Camus. So, yeah, that, that is my video for today. Um, I did have to split into two parts, unfortunately. Um, so, to kind of reiterate, um, maybe not reiterate at all, I think, I think that is sufficient for my video. But, um, yeah, um, yeah, so I th this is, this has been conclusive of my first video ever. Um, I hope to do more in the future to kind of have my train of thought more organized. I realize this has been a very disorganized way of kind of retelling my essay in its proper fashion. Yet, I don't know. We will see how I do, but for now, maybe this is the format of which I will be doing these videos. I will probably even be more organized and have a script ready to kind of go over what I want to cover first and then kind of go on to things that I want to argue against these or argue and defend them. But yeah, um, hopefully this has been fun for you or fun for for me really uh and yeah uh, thanks for watching um my phone is damn so hot